Hey guys, how's it going? Everybody good? I can't believe this is the last weekend of summer. It's gone by so fast. It really has. Um, but, you know, it does every year. So, um, over the next four weeks, we're going to be looking at four statements that could, I'm, I'm calling it, could save a life or definitely could change a life. Four things that all of us at some point in time need to hear, you know, from the people that we're close to, from the people that you know, we love the most. The first thing we're going to look at is the statement for tonight. And the statement tonight is just the words, I forgive you. That's a huge, huge statement. Because if you say, I forgive you, what you're basically saying to somebody is this, I'm going to give you a second chance. You know, um, you get a fresh start. You get a second chance. You get a clean slate. I think everybody's going to need a second chance in life. And that's one of the reasons why it's a, I think it's a foolish thing, and of course this is what the Bible says, so, you know, it's right, because this is what the Bible says, but I think it's a foolish thing to judge other people, and the reason for that is because, you know, there's coming a day when you're going to need some grace, there's coming a day when you're going to need somebody to forgive you, you know, for something, it's just going to happen. Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 and 2, it's in your notes, it says, do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way that you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure that you use, it will be measured to you. So really, if you think about it, if you give somebody grace and if you show somebody grace, it's almost a little bit selfish to do that. Because if you show somebody grace, what's going to end up happening is that somebody's going to show grace back to you. And um, so uh, I think it's a great motivation because that's what God gives us in his word. He teaches us to have that kind of a motivation, you know, from his word. Most of the time, what I've learned is that when people mess up, how many of you believe they know they mess up? Anybody believe that? Yeah. Oh, they know it. And so what they, what they typically don't need is somebody to remind them about it over and over. What typically happens this, if you remind somebody over and over again that they've messed up, they tend to get really discouraged about it and sometimes sink deep into you know, feelings of regret. And I think most of the time what people need to hear the most especially from the people that love them the most, is just the words, you know, I forgive you. And it's, a, it's an awesome thing that sets people free. Next weekend, we're going to be looking at the words, I trust you. I trust you. And I think the number one thing that pleases God, and, and by the way, I think people all over the world are looking for ways to please God. That's why we act out the way we do. We're trying to please him. People all over the world, they know that God exists because they're made in the image of God, and they're trying to find a way to please God. And, you know, they're doing all kinds of crazy stuff. I'm going to walk on my knees. I'm going to climb to this mountain. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do all these different things. And I'm going to please God. When really, at the end of the day, he tells us in his word that without faith, it's impossible to please him. So he's really told us in advance what it is that pleases him. And the crazy thing about it is when you trust in God, he loves it. It pleases him. Now, he made us in his image, right? So I think consequently because of that, when somebody believes in you, when somebody trusts you, it makes you feel great too. I honestly believe that. And that's one of the reasons why without trust, it's almost impossible for a relationship to, to last. If there's no trust in a relationship, it's not going to last. Because every time you deny somebody trust, every time you don't trust in somebody about something, literally what you're doing is, is you're questioning their character. Every single time. And when somebody questions your character or questions your integrity, especially if it's your wife or husband, what if your husband is constantly questioning your integrity or constantly questioning your, your character? After a while, you're going to go, what's the point? I mean, I'm so discouraged because, you know, I want you to trust me. I want you to believe in me, you know. And so if that's constantly going on, it's hard for a relationship to last because we desperately want people to trust in us and, and believe in us. I remember one time I had a conversation with a guy, and this was several years ago, and in the conversation, I sort of kind of questioned his character. I did, and I shouldn't have done it, but I did. Can I tell you this, just to be very transparent with you? Our relationship to this day still has never been the same. It's never been, this, never, it's never been what it used to be before I questioned a person's character. And every time you mistrust somebody, you're questioning their character. And so things just tend to fall apart after a while. And I think what we need to hear from the people that love us are, are the words, I trust you. 
Um, on the third week of the series, we're going to look at the words, I accept you. And I think everybody is crying out for acceptance. You know, we're all wanting to be accepted. And I think about teenagers a lot of times, not just teenagers, but really all of us. We will change what we wear. We will change the people we hang around. We will change the music we listen to. We will change even sometimes the thing we value in our hearts. Maybe it's a, it's a, a, you know, a value that we hold on to, a conviction that we hold on to deep within our hearts, and it's part of our belief system. But we'll change it if we can get accepted by a certain group of people. And I'm not saying that's right. I'm not saying it's good. I'm just saying it's that important to people to be able to make those kinds of decisions when it comes to being accepted. Um, parents, if, if you want to make your home a fortress, then look at your kids and tell them that you accept them no matter what. You accept them no matter how they look. You accept them literally no matter what. There's this, the, this is a place of acceptance because there's a lot of teenagers that struggle with stuff, you know, growing up. And you, you know if you're a parent because you were a teen, you used to be a teenager. I always used to tell my kids that, trust me, I know what you're going through. <laughs> Been there, done that. You know, I know exactly how you feel. And they're like, you know nothing. You're like, oh, I know a whole lot, buddy. <laughs> trust me. Um, but they're all going through this whole process of trying to get accepted. And so just to be able to say, what about, what about to a wife or a husband? You know, there may be a wife that battles with the way she feels that she looks. To be able to have a husband walk up to her and say, baby, I accept you. <laughs> like capital A accept, you know, or whatever. You know, to have a wife look at a husband, even though her husband maybe has been laid off, or even though her husband has, you know, is out of a job, and he's feeling it in his heart, thinking, man, i got to provide for this family, and I'm, I don't feel adequate right now, and all these different things, to have a wife walk up to her husband and say, you know what, baby, I accept you, you know, or whatever. It just kind of makes your, your home, you know, a fortress and a place where you can be accepted. I think those words can be used to save a life. I think those words can be liberating. The last words we're going to look at at the end of the month are the simple words, I love you. I love you. You know what? There are people that are starving for love. Raise your hand if you're starving. No, don't raise your hand. I'm just kidding. <laughs> you're like, yes, me. I'm starving for love. I had a woman tell me one time, she said, literally the only hug I get every week is when I come to Park Valley. It's literally the only hug I get. And, you know, the reason for that is... For some reason, there, there's probably somebody in your life that's close to you that is starving for your love. And for whatever reason, you've made the decision that you're not going to give it. You're just not going to do it. And so what I would say is, I'd just say through this series, rethink that. And tell your wife, tell your husband, tell your friend, tell your parents, whatever it is. Tell them that you love them. Live a life that proves that you love them. It could save a life. It could save a marriage. And these are all subjects we're going to be looking at this month. Tonight we're going to be looking at, you know, I forgive you. It's impossible to go through life without being hurt. You're going to be hurt. It's never a matter of, you know, if you're going to get hurt. It's always a matter of when are you going to get hurt. And so it's just part of life. As soon as you're hurt, and you will be hurt, you're going to go through this process of answering a very important question. The question is going to be, am I going to get bitter or am I going to forgive? That's what you're going to have to answer. And the truth of the matter is, um, forgiveness is the antidote to bitterness. It is the solution to bitterness. It is the opposite of bitterness. And we only have a couple of options when it comes to being hurt. And so let me say right off the bat that bitterness doesn't work. And the reason I say that is because that's what God's word says. There may be times when we are convinced that it's appropriate and we are convinced that it's effective, and we are convinced that it feels good, and to be honest with you, it may feel good a little bit, to be bitter, just for a little while, all right? I'm not going to lie to you. It may feel kind of good for a while just to sulk and to be bitter towards somebody, but let me tell you this. At the end of the day, it just doesn't work, and, and none of those things really are true. This is what God says in his Bible. This is what he says. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 15, this is a verse that's going to help us with our lives. Here's what he says. He says, see to it that nobody misses out on the grace of God because everybody in this room eventually is going to need the grace of God. We're going to need somebody to step up. 
when we flub up and when we sin and when we do something stupid and we're going to need them to show us grace and we're going to need them to forgive us. And so please make sure that nobody misses out on this grace, okay? And please, whatever you do, and I'm adding that in, make sure that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. That's a pretty amazing statement. See, most of the time what we do is, is we look at the actions of people. We sit back and we say, you are mean. You are angry. You are condescending. And I'm tired of you doing these things. You need to change these things in your life right now, mister. Well, that's what we do. I mean, the reason we are, it's just normal for you to look at all of the outward responses in people's lives. What we tend to do is we look at the fruit. What we tend to overlook is the root, okay? We tend to overlook the root because we don't see the root. Now, the anger comes from something, and the condescension comes from something, and the bitterness, or, or not the bitterness, but the anger comes from something, for sure, absolutely, and typically what happens is, is it's a heart problem or it's a root problem. Now, I can go out in my yard and I can look at the yard and see all the crabgrass and all the weeds, and I can get disgusted with my yard because I really try to have a good yard. And for whatever reason, I never have a good yard, even though I really try. I mean, I buy stuff to kill weeds. I buy fertilizer. I go out there. I water the stinking yard. I do everything I can, right? But it still is filled with crabgrass and weeds. Talk to me afterwards if you can help me with that. But <laughs> there you go. The bottom line is this. I can pull crabgrass and weeds all day long. But if I don't get the root, next weekend when I go to mow, it's just all going to be there again. You know what I mean? It's just all going to keep popping back up again. Because the problem is in the root. Here's what the Bible is saying. You have a very good potential there's a strong chance, there's a really good chance that you are going to allow a root of bitterness to creep into your life, and it's going to grow deep within your heart and in your life. The word root means cause, origin, or source. And so literally what the Bible is saying is this, there's a really good chance that bitterness is going to be the cause or the origin of the source of your actions. That bitterness is going to be the cause the origin of the source of the fruit in your life or the actions in your life, and it's all going to be rooted back to bitterness. All those actions are going to go back to bitterness. And you're going to be able to say, hey, you know what? It probably goes back to set that thing in my life that I was never willing to let go. It probably goes back to that thing in my life that I was never willing to forgive. I will never forgive you. Maybe you even said those words to somebody. Maybe you looked at them in the eyes and you said, I will never forgive you for what you did to me. Never. You have no shot of forgiveness on this one. And that bitterness roots in our heart, and all of a sudden it becomes the cause or the origin or the source of all of the actions in our life. Here's one of the reasons why bitterness doesn't work. It doesn't work because the person who offended you ends up going on with their life and forgets that anything ever happened. And the people that are closest to you pay the price. That's what happens. And that's what he warns us in the scriptures. He straight up says, this is what's going to happen. Let me tell you what's going to happen. He says, it's going to cause trouble and it's going to defile many people. It's going to defile the people and cause trouble with all the people around you and the person who offended you is going to get off scot-free because they don't even remember it happened. So it just doesn't work. Another reason why it doesn't work is because it actually gives Satan an opportunity to influence your life. It's almost as if you're saying, you know what, Satan, I think I'm going to give you a little chunk of me. I'm going to give you some of me. That's a dangerous thing. It's a dangerous thing to allow Satan to have jurisdiction in your life, to have a piece of your life, to have license to come in and cause trouble and influence you. There's no reason to do it. He's our enemy. Don't let him in. Bitterness gives him a way in. Don't let him in. And that's literally what the scriptures are saying. The Bible says, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. And do not give the devil a topos. 
Do not give him a foothold. Every once in a while, I work with the civil engineer on the project that we're doing here. And he'll say, hey, Barry, I got some guys coming over to shoot topo. That's what he says. Well, it's short for topography. I want to scope out the region of your land. We want to scope out the, the, the section of your land. What is it that we're dealing with? Don't give Satan a region in your life. Don't give him any entrance or topos in your life whatsoever because he's our enemy and all he wants to do is destroy us. Bitterness doesn't help us. It actually makes us more vulnerable to our enemy. So it doesn't work. If you ever wonder, why is it that we're so involved in actions that cause trouble for the people around us? Well, maybe it goes back to bitterness. If you ever wonder, why in the world you know, are, are we feeling so distant from God? Why do we feel like we've lost our joy when it comes to knowing Christ? I know Christ, but there's no joy. I'm, I believe I'm close to God, but I feel like I'm distant from God. I'm going to tell you this. Maybe it goes back to bitterness. The thing that we are so convinced is appropriate, so convinced it's effective, and God is literally yelling from on high, it doesn't work. Literally all you do is give your enemy legal license in your life to ruin your life. Don't allow it in your life. Don't allow it in your life. Bitterness doesn't work. So here's the question. How do we move on? How do we move on? How do we move on from a situation where somebody has really hurt us in life? Well, there's just a couple quick things and we'll be done tonight. Number one, the first thing we do is this. We realize that it's, it's our job to forgive, and it's God's job to get even. It's our job to let it go. It's God's job to settle the score and to get even, because he's really good at that. I mean, he's God, and he can do it. He's got it totally under control, right? So trust him that he keeps perfect books, that he's the God of the universe, that he's the one that will get even. I was talking to William, my son, he got a brand new job at Liberty. He is on the convocation team, which is basically a team that gets together and plans all the convocations for Liberty University. So they have three convocations a week, one on Monday, one on Wednesday, one on Friday. All the students come out to it, and the team basically gets together and says, let's make sure that this doesn't stink for all the kids that come. We want the kids to want to come to convocation. And so they come up with verses to read and songs to sing and, and you know, ways to get kids engaged at convocation and, and all those different things. So I asked him how it was going. He had only been there for a few days, and I said, how's it going? He said, it's, it's okay. It's, it's not what I expected, and I'm really frustrated about some things. And he started to tell me some stuff that he was really frustrated about. So I'm concerned, but I'm thinking to myself, hey, it's part of life. You got to learn to grow up. You got to be going to be frustrated in life. And things aren't always going to work out the way you expect. How many of you believe that? Anybody raise your hand? Yeah. Everybody believes that because we live it every day. So I talked to him about a week later, and I said, how's it going? This is what he said to me. He said, it's going awesome. I said, okay, so why is it going awesome? This is what he said to me, and I'll never forget it. He said, because I've accepted my role, and because I feel comfortable now within my role. I thought, wow, that right there is a lesson that, t that literally is a key to life. That's the key to life right there. Feeling, accepting your role, feeling comfortable within the role that God has for you, whatever that may be, you know, when it comes to life. I think what happens is this. Somebody hurts us, right? That happens. We decide to take a step out of our role, and we decide... We're going to be the one that gives the vengeance. We're going to be the one that does the payback. We're going to be the one that settles the score. Well, you know what? Every time you step out of your role, you don't feel comfortable. You get frustrated because vengeance is way above your pay grade. The person who's supposed to be doing the vengeance is God. The person who's supposed to be getting even is God. That's not our job. And, and a lot of times in life, we get frustrated because we're so busy running around trying to enact revenge on everybody that's hurt us when God said, wait a minute, no, 
Your job is to let things go. My job is to get even. You're coming outside of your role. You don't have that kind of power. You don't have that kind of ability. Getting revenge again is way, way above our pay grade. So look at what he says in Romans 12, 19. He says, dear friends, when should we avenge ourselves? Well, let's see. Never? That's what the Bible says. This is never. Never avenge yourselves. Leave that to God. For it is written, I will take vengeance. I will repay those who deserve it, says the Lord. So here's the thing. That's God's way of saying revenge is not sweet. Revenge can actually be extremely bitter. God says, you let it go, and I'll take care of getting even. Now, um, you know, God's the one, you know, that takes care of the vengeance. He says our job is in Ephesians 4.31. We're supposed to get rid of things like bitterness and rage and anger and harsh words and slander and malice. Instead, what we're supposed to be is kind, and we're supposed to be tenderhearted. But here's the key. The antidote to bitterness is forgiveness. You're supposed to, I'm supposed to, we're supposed to forgive one another just as God through Christ has forgiven us. It's the antidote. You sit back and you say these words. Well, you know what? I'm sorry, but I can't do that. Here's what I would say. Yes, you're halfway there. It's good to realize you can't do it because you can't. You can't do it on your own. There are people that you are going to be convinced never deserve your forgiveness And that's okay. You're human. But I'm going to tell you this. God will never ask you to do something that he will not give you the strength and the ability to do. He will give you the ability to let it go. He will give you the ability to forgive. He's just going to do it. You know, or else he's not going to ask you to, 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 you know, to forgive. Here's the second thing real quick. Number two, try to restore a relationship. Try to restore the relationship. And, you know, again, Sometimes our goal is not restoration. Our goal is revenge. But we have to step back and say, life's too short to be bitter. It just is. You blink your eyes, you're going to be in your 90s. You know, you blink your eyes, and you're going to be, I I always hate to say an age, because somebody say, what do you mean 90s? 90s is young, you know, or whatever. I don't know. You're going to be in your 120s, you know. (laughs) I don't know. All I know is, life goes by so so fast. Why waste the life that we have on trying to get revenge on someone or trying or being bitter towards someone rather than trying to restore a relationship? So Matthew 18, 15 basically breaks it down. It says this, if somebody sins against you, what you do is you go privately to the person and you point out the fault. The three things there are really awesome because first of all, you got to be proactive and you got to go to the person Basically, what that says to me is keep short accounts. A lot of times, we let things fester and grow and become disgusting, and we don't deal with them, and they get out of control. The Bible says be proactive. If there's a problem, deal with the problem. Deal with it very quickly. Don't let it grow out of control. You know, don't let it be, don't, don't have a situation where a marriage in their 10th or 15th year is breaking up over problems that should have been solved in their first year or fifth year. Why? Deal with them. Be open about them. And the Bible says, go privately to the person. In other words, don't drag their name through the mud. There's no reason in doing that. And then the last thing is, you know, point out the fault. In other words, be, have courage. Have courage to say, Let me tell you what the problem is. Oh, it would be easy not to have confrontation. It would be easy to sweep it under the rug. It would be easy to pretend like it doesn't exist. But you know what? We're not going to do that. This is the fault. This is the problem. This is what offended me. We need to talk about this. I guarantee you, most of the time, you come out of a meeting like that with a new friend or with an old friend. I honestly believe that. Now, are there going to be times when you come out without a friend? Yeah, yeah, that's going to happen. Matter of fact, I see that a lot. You know, I see that a lot. I've experienced it too. And so the Bible says if that happens, what do you do? Well, you go get a witness and you go back to the person and say, look, really, I just want you to know both of us together want you to know that we love you. I forgive you. I want you to know I want this relationship to work. This is something that was you know, offended me. If they don't hear that, you take it to the church. If they don't hear that, 
At some point, you need to look at somebody just with the love of God and just look at them and say, hasta la vista, baby. There are times when you have to stop running after people that God takes out of your life. If God takes somebody out of your life, he takes them out of your life. You know, it's just the way it is. Your job is to forgive them, to let it go, but you also got to realize that you'll never be able to make anybody love you. You'll never be able to make anybody make a decision or do a certain thing or act a certain way. It's impossible to do that. Do everything within your power up until the point where you have to say, I'm sorry, but I got to break fellowship. I got to walk away. I can't let you hurt me anymore. It's just not working. Romans 12, 18, I love it. It says, do your part. <laughs> That's all you can do. All you can do is your part. You can't do their part and your part. You just got to do your part. You do your part to live in peace as much as possible. The implication there is sometimes it's just not possible. Sometimes it's just not possible. And sometimes you have to forgive the person and let them go. This has to happen quickly because the Bible says, you know, you think about the question, how long does it take anger to turn into bitterness? Well, the Bible says right in about 24 hours. Because the Bible says don't let the, sin, the sun go down upon your wrath. And I've known some couples, you know, speaking about in the context of a marriage, they've sat up until they get a problem right before they go to sleep. We're not going to let this go on. We're not going to let this grow and be bigger and bigger and, and, and turn into bitterness and cause that root to... All these actions in my marriage, all these actions with this friendship, all these actions in my work, it's all rooted in bitterness. I wasn't able to forgive. I wasn't able to let things go. I'm going to get a pound of flesh. I'm going to seek revenge. I'm going to make sure that there's justice. Just everything goes south when we take God's job into our own hands. Revenge doesn't heal. It doesn't heal a broken heart. Bitterness doesn't heal a broken heart. I, I end with this verse. Look at Psalm 147.3. It says, he's the one that heals the brokenhearted. God heals the brokenhearted. God binds up the wounds. God counts the stars. God calls them by name. God is the one that's great. God's power is absolute. God has understanding beyond our comprehension. He's the one. We trust in him. He's the only one that I know of that has the power to heal a broken heart. Trust him that he can heal your broken heart. When somebody has hurt you, trust him that he's the one that gets revenge. He's the one that says, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. We just have to trust him. Because to not trust him really is to question his character. It's to question his promise that he will get revenge, that he will take care of things. Because he said he would. I'm telling you, he said he would, and he will. There's healing when you let go and you trust that God will take care of the vengeance. What, what ends up happening is you not only release yourself, but you release everybody around you from the damaging effects that come from a root of bitterness that creeps into our hearts and starts to grow deep. I don't think it's any coincidence that in Matthew chapter 18, in verse number 15, he talks about that whole deal with, um, you know, going to somebody privately and taking a friend and going before the church, going to the church leadership or however that is and all these different things. In the very next few verses, Peter asks the question, how, how many times should I forgive someone? It's in the next few verses. It's not an accident that that, that's there. Seven times? I mean, that's, that's a lot, God. Seven times. I mean, I'm really generous. And Jesus says, well, actually, yeah. Let's go with 70 times seven. And Peter's like, what? Here's one of the reasons why I believe he says that. And I believe it with all my heart. I believe that there are times when hurt in your life is going to be so profound that you're going to have no other choice but to forgive somebody over and over and over and over for the same offense that they have in your life. 
I really believe that. And you're just going to have to keep forgiving them. And I tell people this all the time. I say, you may have to forgive them every hour on the hour. Which may turn into every day, which may turn into every week, which may turn into every month, which may turn into once a year, which may turn into, what was it that we were heard about? Which over time, you begin to heal. But it starts with, even if you have to forgive them minute by minute, trusting God that he's going to take advantage, that he's going to get things even, that he's going to take care of the situation, and that your job is to let it go and to get rid of any kind of root of bitterness that could potentially grow up and really hurt you and the people around you. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes for just a second? Let me ask you this with heads bowed and eyes closed. How many of you, who, who is it that you need to walk up to soon? Maybe even tonight. Who is it that you need to walk up to and say these words? I forgive you. I forgive you. Those words could set someone free. And that someone could be you. You're the one that could end up being set free because you walk into somebody's life and you say, I, I forgive you. That's a powerful thing. Well, I don't have to tell you this because you know it. But Jesus will never ask you to forgive someone else more than he's already forgiven you. I mean, he's forgiven you of everything. If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior and you've been washed in his blood, every sin that you ever committed, every sin that you ever will commit has already been forgiven. It's already been placed under the blood and he's given you a home in heaven. He's made you a part of his family. He has generously forgiven you and taken away your punishment on top of it all. Question is this, who is it that you need to forgive? If you're here tonight and you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, that is, you've never decided to be a follower of Jesus, you've never made that choice to be a Christian, to be a believer in Jesus, that he's God in the flesh, that he died on the cross, that three days later he rose from the dead, and that the blood that he shed on that cross is able to wash away your sins. Maybe tonight's the night that you settle that. Maybe tonight's the night that you give your life to him and your heart to him. I'm going to give you a chance right now to just say a simple prayer and invite Christ into your heart. Why don't you pray something like this? Dear Heavenly Father, I have a lot to learn about the Bible, but I know an awful lot about me. And I know I'm empty inside. I know I'm searching for hope. And I believe that hope is found in Jesus. I believe that. Because I believe that he died on the cross for my sins. And I believe that he rose again from the dead on the third day. And I want you to know that by faith I give you my life right now. I pray that you would wash me clean. I admit it, I'm a sinner and I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Please make me a part of your family. Please change my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I'd like for you to stand if you would please.